All right, welcome everyone. This is Jody Sleeper Triplett of JST Coaching and Training. Thank you so much for coming to the webinar today. And uh, this is part of our JST webinar series. And I have to say that I know there are only a few people on right now and more are coming that this was probably, this was the most highly uh, attended or we had the highest registration of any webinar We've been doing this, we started them this year, but still, um, I'm really excited, very excited that uh, Kay Axtell is here to talk to you about building bridges from high school to the real world. So just a little bit of housekeeping, you are on mute, and we will um, open things up so that you can ask questions. The best way to do it is if you can post your questions in the question box that's listed below. Um, and if for some reason you have any problem with that, uh, once again, we'll, we'll make sure we take care of it. The handouts, um, for those who are listening as well, the handouts are available to you in PDF format so that you don't have to take copious notes. But I know that Kay has a lot to add to her slides with her knowledge and expertise. So you probably will be taking copious notes, as will I. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. and. I want to tell you a little bit about Kay Axtell, our presenter for today. Um, Kay's a JST grad, and I have known her for, gosh, for a long time. Um, we're both still very, very young. We met as babies. So um, <laughs> uh, she's been coaching for over 13 years and was a special ed high school teacher prior to coaching. When she came to the JST training, I have to say that Kay's energy and passion for working with um, teenagers and young adults just struck me. We have had a connection around that um, ever since we met. And I don't get to see her that often because she's out in Colorado and I'm here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, but regardless of how often we see one another, it's always a great reunion. And she has so much to share. So we were talking about um, the issue of the transition uh, from high school to college and some ideas that Kay had and I asked her if she would do a webinar for us and she um, graciously agreed so I'm very grateful. Um, she designed and implemented a program specifically for juniors and seniors in high school transitioning from high school to the real world whether that real world is college or elsewhere and that's what, um, what really feeds her soul and is her passion. And I just, from here on, what I want to do is let Kay tell you anything else about herself that I missed. And she will now, I'm going to put myself on mute. And as I said, if you have questions or you have problems hearing anything, just pop it in the question box. I will be watching. And um, here's Kay. Thank you, Kay. Go right for it. Thank you so much, Jody. And what Jody says is so true. We have such a connection in our passion for working with young adults, as I'm quite certain everybody on this uh, webinar feels the same way. Uh, so thank you again. I mentioned it kind of uh, prior to when we started. There are some more people on now. Thank you so much for attending, whether you're a professional who's working with young adults who eventually are going to be facing that big, bad world whether you're a parent of one of those kids or whether you happen to be a student who's proactive enough to be thinking about these things and what are some of the things I can do to make my transition more successful. So um, again, Jody said plenty about me. Um, I um, totally fell in love with this concept and saw it to be very relevant when I was working with high school kids because we really weren't providing anything for them once they graduated from high school. And when I started coaching uh, right away uh, with high school kids and even noticing with some of my college students who had some challenges that this is just as important for the population of kids that we work with or that we parent um, as it was for those kids in special ed. I also want to mention uh, prior this summer Robert Tedesco gave uh, he gave a great webinar on a similar topic, and when I listened to it, I was reassured that we are kind of pretty much, very much on the same page with all the major points and the understanding of these things that are facing these kids. So I have a few comparisons, and this slide I'm going to get through pretty quickly, but uh, it was just so interesting to me that Robert found very similar um, statistics. My statistics were for kids in special ed. 
the dropout rate for special ed is twice that of their peers. And guess what? Robert discovered the same thing is true for kids with ADHD. Um, regular education students attending college is double that of special ed students. And Robert found uh, kind of a sad but true fact that for kids with ADHD, they are seven times more likely to uh, not graduate from college. And don't want to scare any parents. <laughs> That's part of what this is all about, is how can we better prepare these kids. I think often those of us who are coaches, uh, when we're coaching college students, we see that there are a lot of things that might have made it easier for them that we might uh, get in place uh, early on while they're still in high school. So that is what this is all about. So indeed, ready or not, here life comes, and how can we be facilitators and supporters to these kids to make that transition a little bit smoother? The next slide, again, is it's based on kids with uh, special ed IEPs, and I realize that not all the kids we work with or not all the kids that we parent have an IEP. However, if they do, these are the mandates established uh, legally for uh, kids with an IEP. So if you have a kid with an IEP, you might want to check very carefully to see if these things are happening for juniors and seniors in high school. And if you have a kid that does not have an IEP, it's really um, a very good structure that we can all follow. So the first one is at 16, the annual IEP must include a discussion of transition needs. And I really, really like that emphasis on needs because I think one thing that's critically important is the fact that we look at the kids' needs. We know it's not a one-size-fits-all, so a good look at that. I might mention along with this four kids with IEPs in Colorado that age is 16. And I think it varies by state, but for kids nationwide, uh, at 16, you must have uh, a discussion of transition needs. Um, it also says that the statement must be based on an assessment and goals must be written into the IEP. So it's like any other goal in an IEP, there must be a transition goal for a kid 16 and over or 14 and over. Special planning and goal setting must be a focus. It's got to be documented. So look for that in your IEP if you have one. And just to give you an idea, I think par parents have a lot of uh, they have a lot of say in IEPs. So something you might want to be thinking about is for your particular kid, uh, would it be in the area of academic preparation, independent living skills, or maybe a vocational evaluation? These are the kinds of things we can write in. And then parents have to receive a report on the progress. I know when I taught special ed, we had quarterly checks. So every, qu every quarter, a parent had an opportunity to see how things were progressing with that goal. And that's certainly true for transition as well as other goals. A lot of our kids do not have IEPs. A lot of our kids have 504s. And this is not, it's not supported nearly as much as an IEP. But I think if you have a kid with a 504, there are some very important things to think about. Um, the, major, the major purpose of a 504 is to determine what the kid's needs are, academic needs are, and what kind of accommodations uh, will help this child to access education uh, at, as equally as, uh, as his or her peers. And I think this is critically important for the future, too, because whether you go to college or not, it's really important, and we're going to talk about that a lot today, to, for kids to understand what are my strengths, what are my challenges, what are my um, learning differences, and how can I start asking for help with those things. Another reason to pay attention to a 504 and make it real is that when kids do go to college, oftentimes disability resources will uh, require that accommodations have been in place in high school uh, so that those can be continued in college. So here we have the kid. I've seen so much emphasis, uh, especially with the kids I've coached in the families, that they've got to graduate, they've got to graduate, they've got to graduate, and generally they do, with lots of support, graduate from high school. But then what? Here's the kid, you know, he's gotten this far, but there are no bricks to the other side. So uh, that's what this is all about. And even if you have an IEP, or if you have a 504, or if you as a coach have a plan, how do we take this idea and make it real. So I, I, was, I was wanting, as I was planning this, to try to figure out 
just a minimal number of points that we can continue to focus on as we're working with kids in all these areas. And this is what I came up with. So I'd like you to, to take just a minute and think about that kid that you're working with or that, that child of yours, that student of yours. And our goal is to get our students to ask themselves these questions as we're working through these things still in high school. Who am I? Where am I going? What might get in the way? And what can I do about it? Those are the steps across the bridge. Who am I leads to self-determination. It allows, a, it allows a student to be an advocate. Um, some thought and conversation about where they're going is critical for future planning, exploring options. And as we know well, those of us uh, that are coaches or parents, that the big things that get in the way for our kids are those executive functioning challenges. They get in the way both in school and in life. And that's where we can really come in and help the kids identify those particular challenges and the kinds of things and strategies that they can develop to be more successful. And when this starts in high school, it, it works much, much better out there in the real world. So how do kids find out who they are? There are, I really like assessments, and I personally, I'm very, very much a strengths-based person and coach, so I believe that before a person can really look at some of the difficulties that they have in life, it's very important for them to understand their strengths. Um, what am I good at? What have I accomplished? What are my talents? Um, what have people said about me in a positive way? And once that's firmly grounded, it's much, much easier to look at what are some of my challenges, both in school and in life. Um, and kids need to know both. And this benefits them immensely because our final goal for kids, and especially kids who are facing the real world, is to get them to be advocates for themselves. An advocate knows who they are. They know what their strengths are and what their um, challenges are, and they know what helps them, and they know how to ask for that. So ideally, I know my last year of teaching in high school, I suggested to the special ed director, we should have portfolios on these kids. We should have their assessments and their inventories and uh, even their grades and the things they've done and uh, their, some of their uh, community involvement. Uh, and we should have that all together. It never happened. I don't think it happens in high schools. But it's something that as coaches and parents that it would be a great idea to either have a file, paper file, or have something on the computer where you're tracking all these kinds of things um, that kids have learned about themselves and that we know about them. So there are a couple of great URLs. One is called Life After IEPs, and the other one is um, it's actually it comes out of Hawaii. And both of these URLs have uh, all kinds of ideas, inventories, assessments, um, ideas about how to start planning and moving forward in the world. So some of you are, I'm sure, parents, and some of you are professionals. If you're a parent, it is never, ever, ever too early to start working with your kid on some of the things that are really going to help them be more successful when they don't have your structure and support and they're out there on their own. For example, you can start working with a very young child on just money management, uh, maybe a simple diary of what's coming in and what's going out, um, teaching them to cook, teaching them to uh, shop, write recipes, do their laundry. So a parent can do a lot. And parents, I know for a fact, because of my coaching, are very involved in their kids' learning processes and, and what helps them and advocating for the kids. And of course, we want to turn that over to the kids themselves. Uh, for professionals, we have an incredible opportunity to help kids find out who they are. Um, Jody's parent information form, her teen, her teen information form, has some great opportunities for us to ask kids as soon as we meet them in the initial meeting. Um, what are you good at? What are your favorite um, classes? What are your least favorite classes? Um, what has worked for you up to this point, and where do you want to go with your life? Um, there are tons of assessments. Uh, and uh, actually, I didn't mention with the assessment section, but there are some assessments, quite a few assessments in the resources, which will be at the end of this webinar, and you will have those handouts. Um, one of them that I really like is called Strengths Finder 2. And this is a book. You've got to buy it new because it's got um, a code in it. And so you go into the computer with the code, 
or the kid does, and answers questions, and it, it will give them their five major strengths. If you're going to work with high school kids and use StrengthsFinder 2, I would highly suggest that you're involved in the conversation about the results um, because it really helps them understand, is this a good match for them? And it usually is. Uh, but but it also uh, just brings it home to them how they might be able to use these strengths in their life. There's also one called VIA, and that is a, a character strengths, uh, much simpler to understand. That's free. It's, on, it's in your uh, resources. And uh, it's, again, online, an online assessment that you can take. And it will give 24 character strengths, starting with your best and ending up with um, your least um, strong characteristics and it's got like a two-page explanation for each so these kinds of things can be really helpful and then I think information sharing as we go along the entire time we're working with kids or if there are kids continued conversations about these kinds of things so what's next pretty much when I first meet families of kids in high school the focus is college they are going to college it's absolutely it they're going to go to college and while this is very important in today's world and I understand that I think that if this is what uh, parents and kids are definitely looking at uh, and I'm going to talk about this quite a bit there are a number of things to do in high school to make that um, a better choice however there are other options for kids and especially for our kids a kid might gain tons of experience by going to work right out of high school. And we know that lots of our kids kind of lag in, in maturation, as brilliant, as creative as they are. Um, sometimes they maybe aren't quite ready to, to take on the big world. So there are things called gap years. And we're going to talk about all these possibilities. So the first one is bridges to college start in high school. And all too often, I see that. Um, Although the goal was college, a lot of things weren't happening in high school that would have made that work much better. So again, another great website is www.goingtocollege.org, and it's got absolutely everything on it that you could possibly use to assist these kids. I have uh, four checklists, and for the sake of time, because I want to cover things other than college, I'm not going to hit every one of these um, every one of these, but again, you will have them on your checklist or on your um, handouts, and you can just kind of use these to, they're a great, great structure to follow through for, with a kid throughout high school, starting freshman and, and going all the way through seniors. So we've talked a lot about know your strengths and understand your disability. Uh, participate in your IEP or 504 if you have one. Learn to talk to your teachers. I know and we know that college uh, students benefit enormously when they talk to their teachers. And the time to start doing that is when you're in high school. And again, if you know who you are and what you're good at and what's challenging and what works for you, you have all that information, then it's much easier to share it. Um, you can start exploring career options. I think it's a good idea. Lots of families tell me, well, you don't have to really decide that until your junior year in college. But I think it's a good idea to start looking at things that are good matches. Volunteering is a good idea. Uh, and if you are planning to go to college, there are tons of resources in your local high school. Just walk into the guidance uh, office and you will see them. But more important than anything else, learn what strategies, accommodations, and assistive tech will help you. I think our kids are great with assistive tech as a social media, but oftentimes they're not aware of all the support that they can get using it, even in high school if that's allowed, and definitely in college. And I think being able to draw the line and say, this is when I'm using it socially, and this is how I'm going to use it to assist me. Um, it, it depends to some schools. Some high schools are really supporting that, and some are not. As a junior, continue to be very verbal in your meetings. Uh, I think high school guidance counselors pretty well take care of uh, prep courses. Again, uh, all the way through high school is an excellent opportunity to learn about your strengths and your challenges and what works. Um, career, career exploration at this point, I believe in. Uh, I think it really helps, and it's not too soon to start going to college fairs. I would guess that every high school in, in the country has a college fair at some point in time, and you don't have to wait until you're a junior to go to those. Um, your junior year, um, again, a major part 
uh, of contribution in your IEP meeting or your 504 meeting. And I think the big one, and Robert talked about this as well, the big one is that things are really, really different in terms of support once you leave high school. You won't have your parental support. Uh, you won't have your, um, your parent as your frontal lobe. There will be all those executive functioning challenges. You'll need to figure those out. And if you want support, it's important to be able to ask for it. Uh, again, high school is a perfect opportunity to, feel, to figure these things out. Uh, and junior year, I think your junior year and between your junior and senior year are, are perfect times to start visiting some college campuses. I'm going to give you some ideas of how to go to those visits and get some of the answers that you want. Um, and if you can't do that, there are virtual tours or you can, I'm sure, have conversations with people at those colleges who would like to have your student attending. Senior year, um, we had a, when high school, the state was trying to get us to get our kids to lead their IEP meetings, and that never happened. <laughs> but I did have uh, transition meetings for each one of my kids, where, and they did lead that meeting, and it was a great experience for them, you know, with administrators and parents and counselors uh, to speak up about what they needed and where they were going. Uh, meet with your counselor earlier in, early in the year. Uh, counselors, when I've had kids as seniors, the counselors were really good about meeting with those seniors and you know, seeing if they're on track and talking about where they're going to go. However, sometimes that comes, you know, that happens, that visit happens sometime a little bit too late. So I have a kid who's between his junior and senior year. And he actually emailed his teacher so that he could go in early on and talk to her because he knew that uh, there were going to be tons of kids trying to get to her. So again, that self-advocating is definitely to your advantage. Um, uh, visiting colleges, again, uh, if you're planning to go to college, they suggest that you apply to at least two. I've heard that you should apply to five. One that you think might just be a little out of your reach and one that you think is a shoe-in. And then uh, colleges somewhere in between uh, because you won't be accepted all of them probably. Disregard uh, the bullet about swap. That, that's all about kids who are going to work. And then as coaches and parents, we know that um, senioritis <laughs> is real. So I encourage my kids to get all this stuff handled the best they can so that when they just kind of are out of steam, uh, they've got things taken care of. So what are some of the things you want to look for when you are exploring college options? Um, and I would take this little list with me when I, when I go to campuses or when I have a conversation. You want to see what kind of disability support services they have. And I know uh, tons of kids that I have coached have been very resistant uh, to signing up for disability support services. Um, and Robert mentioned that as well. I think you know there's a stigma attached. They think they can do it on their own now. They don't want other kids to know, and other kids usually have no idea. Um, so it takes some work, and that's something that we might start working on right now with our kids too, because it's tremendously helpful when you're going to a campus, whether your student says they're going to access the services or not. It wouldn't hurt to check them out and see what they offer. Uh, what kind of tutoring is available? Our kids can really use tutoring. We know that. Uh, does this school have a specialized program for kids with disabilities? Denver University, which is a private school in, in Denver, has a special program for those kids. It costs more money, but uh, tons of support for those kids. And, I, and I'm sure that other states have those colleges as well. Writing centers is something that I don't think our kids often think about, but they are available to everybody, and they can save you so much time and grief. You end up with a much better product. You need to have your assignment done, <laughs> not at the very last minute, but uh, if you start on an assignment and go in, they're going to help you so much, save you so much time, and as I said, you're going to end up with a much better product. I know so many of our kids really struggle with math, and if that happens to be your student, then check math centers. Check what kind of support is offered for kids in math. And uh, counseling services, there's a lot to deal with. You don't have to have heavy-duty mental health issues to um, have some, some difficulties coping with 
all these these new situations that you're facing on your own for the first time. So good counseling services on campus is a really good idea. And then again, if there's a good career center, that will help you with, with future plans and kind of where you're going with your major and maybe even to motivate you to get through your first two years of class in a health center you might want to check out. Some of the accommodations that are really, really helpful uh, for kids are, and I found this to be very true for the kids that I coach, some disability resources will give you the option for priority registration. So you can register before anyone else, which is just key for our kids. You can, you stand the best chance of getting uh, the classes that meet your schedule. You know, maybe not early morning classes. Maybe you want to space them out a certain way. Uh, if you um, are really thorough, you might have checked rate your professor to see uh, what kind of teacher is going to work best for you. Uh, or talk to some other kids about what those classes are really like. So if you get, uh, if you beat everybody else to the punch in registration, it's going to be very, very valuable for you. I know this is difficult <laughs> for our kids. Sometimes they register really late, but what I've seen is that the kids that start taking advantage of that priority registration, they really appreciate how much it does for them. Uh, these other, all these things might. Uh, be something that disability resources would offer on a campus, and they might not. Um, reduce, reduced course load, uh, substitutions. I'm not sure about those two, but most disability resources, or access centers as they're sometimes called, uh, have note takers and recording devices. Extended time on tests, which is really helpful for our kids sometimes because uh, just it takes the anxiety factor away and it also helps them to go back and see if they've rushed through and made some careless mistakes. Deadline extensions with a professor approval can be an advantage and a disadvantage. <laughs> I did have a kid that didn't want to use disability resources and he did actually, um, he really floundered first semester that I coached him and then he decided it might be helpful but for financial reasons they decided to get his psychological his documentation uh, done on campus and so that was some red tape that took a while so he floundered in a, during another semester because he didn't really have that assistance so by the time he got it he was ready to use it and I think at the end of the semester they were ready to lock the door <laughs> keep him away he met with them once a week. They helped him immensely. Uh, it helped a great deal with his instructors. And for him, he was in computer science. So he, um, he just could never have gotten things done on time uh, without this. And uh, he really relied on it heavily. Uh, refining study skills is uh, something, a really, it's something to really check out. Uh, how active is your disability resources office in actually helping kids understand uh, what their challenges are and what works best for them. Uh, and then separate areas for test taking is offered by almost all disability resources. Um, going back to um, refining your study skills, I, I wanted to mention there is a resource that I left out, uh, and I don't know why I did that, but it's a book, and the name of it is Learning Outside the lines. The first part of it's really scary if you're a parent because this, this is an LD kid and an ADHD kid that got into all kinds of trouble. <laughs> you don't want to see these things happen for your child or your student, but um, they did end up in the second half of the book coming up with some very unique uh, ideas that survival skills that they created that might be really helpful and they both graduated from Brown and wrote a book and now they're going to or they were going to high schools and helping kids with uh, all this kind of stuff. So I, I brought these in because of my experience in coaching uh, college students <laughs> and if these things can be addressed in high school well, then uh, they are going to be uh, way ahead of the game in college. Uh, get very serious about calendars. They're critical. Uh, blocking out the times that your classes are, looking at the times you have in between, determining what your assignments are and estimating the amount of time it's going to take, and plugging those in to the spaces that you have assigned for study. We work on that all the time. Uh, you need to be organized either with notebooks or you need to at least, I know some, some of my kids have struggled with where their information was on the computer. Uh, so get something uh, organized uh, in terms of where you're keeping stuff. 
Um, we talked about disability resources and tutoring. Syllabus, absolutely make it your Bible. I insist that all my college students share the syllabi with me from every class, and we go over it every week. Uh, and then also communicating with your instructors, which I mentioned before, that is absolutely invaluable. Uh, and again, it, they appreciate it. Most instructors and teaching assistants like it when kids come in and want help. And it kind of gives uh, them a better perspective of you as a student. And then we talked a little about technology, too. There is assistive tech that can help you and, assist, and then technology that can hurt you. But uh, if you can learn to use it correctly, it's very valuable. And one of the things I found uh, with college students is the information about their assignments doesn't always come from the same place. And this is really difficult for them. It might be in a personal email, and then they have to know their password. <laughs> it might be something online. It might be Math Lab, or it might be Canvas. And so um, to determine early on, how is each instructor going to communicate assignments to me? Also getting used to the idea that lots of instructors say it's due midnight on Tuesday when they don't have a class till 10 o'clock or 1 o'clock the next day. That can throw the kids as well. And I can't stress enough, get to the writing centers early and often. It's free tutoring. So college is you know, something that makes sense, uh, important in today's world. And it's pretty much what everyone is focusing on and going for. However, I really wanted to give some time to some of the alternatives to four-year colleges. The kids that I work with pretty much um, want to go to CU or CSU because they really want to go to some school on the coast, but they know they won't get into that. Uh, and so if you mention a community college, they really have a hard time with that. Community colleges, I know from my own personal experience, I went back as an adult and got some of the best education I've ever had. Best support, best material. I was able to do really well there and then uh, get easily into any four-year college that uh, of my choice. And I think this uh, is a fact for a lot of our kids. It does, a community college can be a nice alternative to that four-year school. The downside is, of course, they don't have the dorm life, the social life. We have a campus, and this might be something to look at. We have a campus in the Denver metro area that has two four-year schools and a community college and also some housing in place. So the kids can kind of get that feel for um, that college life. Uh, so something like that might be helpful. There are tech schools and we are really, really desperate for kids with good technical training uh, businesses are, industries are. So checking those kinds of things out if you have a hands-on kit. When I taught the school, apprenticeships were common. I think that's fading away, but I think it might come back, and I hope it does. And on the job training, I, my brother-in-law is a um, he's an electrical he has an electrical contracting company in the metro area, and he's very frustrated because they're turning away millions of dollars because they cannot take jobs because they don't have enough electricians to fill those roles. They, as a matter of fact, will offer uh, to any kid that goes to electrician school, whatever that is, and comes to work for them, if they end up being a, uh, an effective employee, they will pay half their tuition. And I can't help but think that there are all kinds of things out there like that for kids. Uh, I also noticed when I was kind of searching around that um, I think it's in Maryland and Virginia that the International Brotherhood of Electrical Union, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Union, uh, they are very interested in the same concept. You might Google that, and they're trying to uh, make it more possible for um, for kids to, you know, get some training in some of these fields. And I could see some of our kids doing really well in those fields, and there's some good money to be made. So. Um, those are some of the options. Let's look at the option of if you are a transitioning from high school to the world of work. There are, um, I think this is another thing kids don't think about, and I do sometimes get a client who, well, he's not going to high school, he's going to get a job. And oftentimes, I don't think they look at that seriously enough to make that a good learning experience or a good position for the kids. There are agencies and resources that can help uh, kids who are choosing to go to work instead of to go to college. Um, again, this can start in high school. 
I think work experience programs are almost a thing of the past. We had them in place when I was teaching a very long time ago, and I do know that. Denver Public Schools are beginning to work on some of those things and finding them to be very effective. Um, one thing kids don't get, and lots of times I coach young adults or even high school kids uh, to practice interview skills and resume skills because they don't have a clue. And they're going to stand a much better chance of getting a much better job that's a much better match if they have somebody working with them on these things. So either a parent or a coach can work on this. Um, there are, uh, I'm going to jump one because I'm talking about this and talk about Explore Youth Workforce Centers. There are workforce centers all across the United States and they're pretty well supported by county governments. And in our tri-county area, they have a youth room where they actually work with kids, helping them with interview skills and resumes, those kinds of things. I think we would probably know them as employment offices. Um, and so there are a lot of people that have been laid off or <laughs> forced to go to work uh, that aren't your age. However, they offer all kinds of assistance, uh, getting online and looking for jobs. Um, they offer classes in interview skills, classes in resume writing, and they're free. So again, a kid would have to bite the bullet and be there with a bunch of older people, but there's, there are tons of resources there. And I myself have gone to those centers and gotten some of their material and used those with kids. In Colorado, there's something called the School to, uh, School to Work Alliance program, and that was incredibly helpful for my kids. It was uh, through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, and they actually had people working that came into the schools, worked with my kids, helped them get jobs. Um, it, was, it, was, it was just key for some of these kids who were going to work. I don't believe that that is available everywhere, and you would need to check with your uh, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation in your state to see what kind of services they might offer. But I was surprised to find some very high-functioning ADHD kids were qualified and did get jobs with their assistance. Volunteering is always a great idea uh, because even if these kids aren't going to college, they still are in that exploration stage and to find out what is a really good match for them. Several years ago, I um, went to a learning disability conference and met the most incredible people from the most incredible programs. They were, there were people in the construction industry who were working through a community college and partnering with a high school. So they actually were training kids while they were still in high school uh, in some field and when these kids graduated from high school they had a career. Uh, I remember one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this is that uh, when I first started uh, school, I took a job as a driver because in our little county they didn't uh, want to run a school bus down to the bigger county where they had vocational programs. So I drove these kids every day to their classes at the vocational school in another county and I was so impressed with how engaged they were with their coursework. So uh, I think it's a great thing, a great thing to explore. They were happy and excited. And they even said they'd rather graduate from Warren Tech than from the high school that they went to. So gap year. This is something that I see kids kind of light up and I see parents kind of cringe because the idea of just taking a year off between high school and college could be really, really scary. Uh, so structured, the key word is structured. And there are a number of ways to do this. There are tons of gap year programs, and I believe, I went to one a few years ago, and I believe uh, if you Google something like USA Gap Year Fairs, they would mention, they go, they travel all over the country, all these people offering programs, and you can go and pick up information and talk to them. Uh, things like going to a third world country, helping poverty people, uh, maybe doing some kind of adventure, maybe a kind of a semester at sea kind of experience. Uh, there are tons of things that might be a good match uh, for your student who is needing a little bit of time between high school and what they're really going to do. Uh, and then again, they're expensive. If you have the means, I think they're really good. And if not, there are other options. One of my favorite stories is about Sophie. And it's one of my favorite stories. I was researching this, and she is actually from Colorado. I don't know her, 
but she was in a single parent family, didn't have a ton of money, and wanted to be a sculptress. So what she did was she took her money and went to North Carolina to, uh, to be in some kind of a, an artist colony uh, training experience where she got to work side by side with artists and learn the trade, which she loved. And also developed a confidence that, wow, I think this is my thing. I think I'm pretty good at this. So her money ran out, of course, and she went to um, back home, worked as a nanny for a year to make money, and then went to college. She ended up at Beloit College studying art. Uh, so I think, you know, gap years can allow, if they're structured correctly, they can allow a kid to really figure out um, what is really a good fit for them because they have this hands-on experiential situation which uh, can answer a question for them. I had a kid who was almost through school but his parents were getting kind of frustrated with his school performance. He was uh, loved photography. So he took a gap year, I think between his junior and senior year, and got out into the real world and started doing photography. Some of it was for money. His dad helped him figure out how to market his work. And some of it was volunteer. He went to the local fire department, and he, <laughs> he, uh, he photoed their burns their controlled burns, and he'd come in to session smelling of smoke, and it was kind of cool, but you could tell he was very passionate about it, and had that parental support helping him to realize there's a business into this, too. So he did that for a year, and I think it uh, definitely settled the point for him that this is what he's meant to do, uh, and then he is going back to school. So. Independent living is kind of an aside, but it's huge, and I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that our kids face when they get out there on their own, uh, away from their parents and away from the structure of school, is just knowing how to live. I know I've had parents say, well, you know, we gave them, you know, four or five hundred dollars for the semester and it was gone in like two months. So uh, again, starting in high school, teaching the kids some money management skills. And uh, in my transition workshops, we really emphasize getting some kind of a very simple budget in place and getting used to that before you go. And we had a kid that ended up uh, doing that. He was, he was a very uh, receptive kid. You know, most of our kids don't like that paperwork kind of stuff, but he took that on. And then he told his mom, Mom, these other kids don't know how to handle their money. So <laughs> a good thing uh, to get them going with. All kinds of life skills I've talked about, you know, being able to cook, uh, being able to do your laundry. Interpersonal relationships, uh, you're going to run into all kinds of interesting situations once you're away from home. Healthy living, it's not always their favorite thing, but I truly believe that in order to be at your best, you need to be getting plenty of sleep, uh, the right kind of food, and some exercise. These are probably the toughest things for a kid to take on on their own. Uh, time management, starting to work on how am I going to get my homework done, uh, is you know really helpful to have that in place when you get uh, to school. It's also helpful if you have a job. <laughs> are your parents going to call you? And I had a kid that this happened. He was from Texas and he was in Colorado. His mom was calling him to get him up to get. Uh, to school. And, so, uh, and medication management, very critical. Uh, do your kids take medication because you're reminding them? Or does a school nurse call, you know, call somebody down? How do they take those things on? So at any rate, um, it takes a village, and we are the village. And once a kid graduates from high school, uh, sometimes there aren't the same number of ants supporting the twig as there were. And so putting some of these things in place for our kids or our clients or for ourselves, I think, is really, really key. So this was just a very fast overview. I did mention early on, and you will have these. These are some books. Unfortunately, I left out. So if you have a piece of notebook paper, uh, I left out Learning Outside the Lines, which <laughs> is one of the best books a kid out there on their own kid uh, possibly have, especially if they're going to college. Uh, Wil Wilma Feldman's uh, book on building a career that works for you, I've used that a lot in some career exploration stuff with kids, especially if they're just going to work, or maybe to kind of help them start to earlier on start more clearly defining uh, the major if they're going to college or the job that they want. Uh, and then these others are some classics for uh, kids going to college. All very good. 
And these websites are incredible. I mentioned a number of them. One of them that I just ran across is educationplanner.org. Got everything we've talked about. Nextstepstock.org comes out of uh, Canada. Excellent. Uh, Life after IEPs. Career One Stop, that is the employment center. Uh, and I mentioned via character, and then I just ran into uh, advance.com, which is Patricia Quinn and Kathleen Nadeau, and they have got, I, I bought a whole book, uh, just incredible ebook for college students. So, did this resonate? resonate sorry. And what are the next steps for your kid? So, questions. Um, I guess, oh, I'm not looking at the question box. Are you, so are you ready saying, for questions? I just yes, I'm ready for questions. Great. Kay, we've already had a couple people comment on how wonderful this is, and I tell you, I've learned so much already, and there are always those days when it's like, oh, I'll put the list together, I'll put the list together. So you've done it for me and for a lot of others. So I'm going to open up the, um, the microphone as soon as I find a little button to do so. So I Thank you, Jerry. Unmute everyone. Let's see if I can make it work. And I'm unmuting people. And so you're all going to be unmuted. Hopefully no one is doing anything overly loud, but I'm just going to do this to make it a little easier. Um, anyone have a question that they'd like to ask Kay? I'm just unmuting you all because the other button so I know there's a little background noise. Um, if you, any questions while I'm doing this? Okay, so let me see. So I, I have a question while we're waiting for others to formulate questions. Um, Kay, is that when you talked about gap year, and a lot of students do take a gap year, and I've had um, students that I've worked with who have also done that. And one of the things that pops up is that it's the question about what, how structured does a gap year need to be? And for students who just need a, a break and a chance for their executive functioning skills to develop as their brain develops and mature, um, do you have some suggestions uh, in terms of what some of the, what, what, what level of structure you'd recommend for students for the gap year? Oops. Are you still there, Kay? Uh, let me check and see if she can still answer. Hmm. Oh, okay, Kay, can you, um, okay. now, sorry, I don't know why you I ended can, up on mute, but um, you heard my question. I know, and I, yes, I did, and I couldn't get out of it. I think with everything that you absolutely, uh, it's critical to really know that kid, how much structure do they need. Some kids, yes, I've worked with some kids who did just kind of need to work for a couple of years, and even just working sometimes will help them decide, I don't think I want to do this. I think I'll go to college and find an easier way. But for some kids, like the girl that I mentioned, the photographer kid that I had, and there was another example I didn't bring up of another kid who was a photographer in India, and then he came and volunteered for political campaigns, and then he was convinced, I want to do this enough to go to college and make it work. Yeah, so I think great. it depends on the kid. That's great. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to mute everyone again just because we have some background noise. And I'm just looking at the chat box for questions. And I think we've answered everything. Um, and please, if any, any of you listening now or later on, um, Kay's information is on the presentation. You can always email me at jody at jstcoaching.com as well, and I'm happy to forward things to Kay uh, so she can answer your questions directly. And Kay, thank you again for being here and for providing such great information to everyone. I uh, really appreciate it. Oh, was there a first book that was answered? Um, 
that was mentioned, excuse me, before learning outside the lines. The Cafe Nado book, is, that, is there another one that you missed that you mentioned, Kay? Whoops, there we go with muting again. Okay. Um, was there a diff another book before that one? By any chance? Still muted? Now there we go. Okay. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> it's, it's a funny feeling trying to tell somebody you're muted when you're, when you're muted. Um, I did not mention another one. I, um, uh, learning yeah. outside the lines is incredible. There are lots of new ones. Those were just a few. Uh, I just came across the website ADDVANCE, and that's already always been there. Yeah. They've got some great stuff for college kids now. They do, and some of the other books that you did mention are on your list. So that's something in case um, yeah. Yeah. Michelle, who asked, in case you don't find it, I think it's it's there. Um, and then Robin Nord Robin asked, um, Kay, how do you like to use the portfolio you mentioned for high school? That you know, that's something that it's more idealistic than actually in practice. But when uh, I wish high school. Uh, high schools would do it. When I taught high school, um, they, the kids took these career inventories and the guidance counselors didn't even make them available to us as special ed teachers. So I ended up going with my kids while they were taking those assessments. Um, so if you're a parent, I'd say definitely do it. If you're a coach, if you can talk, again, the, the, the first cell is talking to them about thinking about their future. There seems to be some sort of avoidance of that for understandable reasons. But if you can get a kid to uh, keep all that information in a portfolio, it's ideal. A cell to parents might be something that, uh, I remember a kid who went to high school with my son, that mother started a similar kind of thing for him and he wasn't ADD or uh, special ed, but she kept track of all this stuff for him in a portfolio. So when he got ready to write his college essay letter, it was a cinch. So I would, you know, I haven't even done it myself, but I think it is ideal. And I think uh, Mary Mazzotti in uh, Life After IEPs talks about some ways you can do that. And she's got a blog too. Great. And one more great question, Michelle. Um, do you have any magic words for the students who don't want to take advantage of college resources even when they know they would help them? The best, I know, this is just a big issue. I think uh, starting early on in high school and really supporting their advocating for themselves. I have a student who wasn't doing it at all. Now he is doing it. And I think he might end up doing a gap year, but he's actually going in and talking to teachers. You've got to know who you are, what works for you, what are your challenges, what are your strengths, uh, and then start practicing. We have an incredible organization in the Denver area called the YES program, and these kids are ambassadors, and they speak at conferences and all kinds of things, advocating for themselves and saying who they are. So I think we can do a lot as parents and professionals to support them in learning this and really push them to start talking to uh, teachers and how helpful it is, how helpful 504s are and how much they use those so that when they do go to school, they'll realize disability resources provide the same thing. And the other thing is that you don't have to use it. You can go and sign up. <laughs> and uh, then you only give the letters, generally, to the instructors that you choose to give them to. So I think just a whole lot of taking that fear out. Yeah, it, would take, it does take some magic. Great. Thank you. OK. Anything else? So I think we're good. All right. Well, again, Kay, thank you. And I'm glad that we stayed for a minute to look for questions. And um, if anyone has anything else, I really appreciate it. And we will have another webinar coming up next month, um, topic to be announced, and some business building webinars as well. So thank you all, and have a great uh, rest of the summer. Thanks, Kay. Thank you, Jody. So